Hello! Welcome to another episode of the Roy Unit Experience, where we can all waste time together talking about things that may or may not be important. If you're coming back after the first episode, I'm glad you like what you've seen so far. If this is your first time with us, remember that if your expectations are low enough, you'll always be pleased. Well, after last episode's adventures with poorly executed plans from outer space, I've decided to look at a movie whose action is a bit more down to earth. And what could be more action-packed than good old-fashioned drag racing? That's right, today we're watching The Fast and the Furious. Oh, but not the Fast and the Furious you're thinking of. This is the original Fast and the Furious, made in 1955. Hey, I said keep your expectations low. Yes, not many people know that years before Vin Diesel and company tore up the streets of Los Angeles, another racing movie was made under the same title, starring Canadian-born actor John Ireland and actress Dorothy Malone, who were both gaining popularity in the 1950s B-movie circuit, thus proving further that there are no new ideas in Hollywood. Actually, I shouldn't say this is the original, since the 2001 version of Fast and the Furious isn't technically a remake. The story of the 1955 film is widely different from the 2001 film, with the main similarities being in the title and the fact that both movies involve some kind of racing. And to go back even further, while I was researching for this movie, I found that there's another movie called Fast and Furious, which dates back to 1939. It features a husband and wife detective team on vacation who find themselves trapped in the murderous web of a racketeer from New York. I guess it all just proves that people have been stealing ideas in Hollywood forever. This version features a young racer named Kanye Adair, played by Dorothy Malone, on her way to an international race in Southern California, who is abducted by a fugitive convicted of murder trying to get across the border to Mexico. Sounds pretty intense. In fact, many consider it a part of the grindhouse genre of B-movies. Though, frankly, it's not anywhere as intense or shocking as the Hellcats. However, the film was a commercial success at the time, grossing five times its budget of $50,000. So, why don't we see what all the fury is about in The Fast and the Furious? Okay, so let me just hit play here and... Wow! Are you sure we didn't miss something there? Well, at any rate, you can't accuse them of wasting time getting to the action. I guess they knew how to pander to the drag racing audience. They came for car racing and wanted to see it now, con darn it. And here we have our leading lady, Connie, driving her sleek white Jaguar Roadster. Boy, I can't wait to see her put the pedal to the metal in this baby. Or she could just pull into a rest stop for a while. What? Wait a minute, what's the penguin doing around Saddle Peak Lodge, California? So these two go into the cafe, which is run by a lady whose two hobbies are complaining about everything and speaking in exposition. I couldn't find anything back there, but I put your hamburger on. Oh, forget it. Great pictures will do. That I know we haven't got. Say, did you two hear about that guy that broke out of jail up in Coachella? Some jail they got up there, huh? I'm telling you, honey, it ain't safe on the road these days. Well, I wouldn't worry. Well, worry or not, it ain't safe. This guy, they call Webster, drove a truck right off the road. Murder, that's what it is. You could say that again. Uh, I don't think running a car off the road is necessarily murder. It sounds like it could just be bad driving. Listen, every truck on the highway is watching for this guy. We'll find him. And when we do, he won't even have time to think about getting away. There's no way to win a car chase with a trucker, especially with their big, heavy vehicles, which require many gear shifts to reach any kind of cruising speed. I wonder if you could get the pineapple juice. Now, sure, lady, be right back. The sad part is that this place has the best service in town. You know him? Webster? No. Nope. Hear about it? How can I help? Interested? No. No, I'm not. If I'm giving you a lift, Mayors, I'd like to see your identification. I didn't say I wanted a lift. Maybe I'd better see it anyway. Sure. No, no, you don't 
Oh, better watch out, man. A big, thick guy like that isn't gonna go down easy. Oh. Okay. So it doesn't take long for Connie to realize that Bill Myers is escaped convict Frank Webster. Come on. But meanwhile, baby Jane Hudson returns to find that the only business she's had in two weeks has either disappeared mysteriously or been bashed over the head. Seriously, you're just assuming he's dead without going over to him or trying to see if he's okay? Ah, oh, crap. The one time I want to make a quick getaway, we're stuck behind a dang funeral procession. You're going to see a lot of cops and lots of people before we cross the border. Just behave yourself. Act natural and there won't be any trouble. But it seems like they won't see too many more cops now that they've turned onto Film Projector Boulevard. And just in time to give us a taste of the misogyny that only the 1950s can deliver. I like quiet women. Stay that way. Hmm. But fortunately, she's got a trick up her sleeve that's sure to get her out of this. There's a gas station ahead. Better fill up before dark. You can do better than that. See? Even the movie thinks the writing is weak. But the joke's on him, as it turns out, because the car actually does need gas. Time to put her surefire plan into action. Someplace? Oh, never mind. But it's just as well he found her since she probably would have broken her neck once that wobbly stack of tires fell over. And here's where the main problem of the whole kidnapping narrative is. The movie doesn't really do a good job of setting up any tension or fear or suspense over the fact that this woman is being held hostage by a mysterious man convicted of murder. I mean, for the most part, she doesn't seem all that upset about the fact that she's being held hostage by this guy. Yeah, she has, like, some outbursts or something, but really it seems more like she's just teasing him along and playing hard to get in some kind of weird blind date. Take this scene, for instance, where a cop's chasing them on the highway and she decides to stop the car by throwing the keys out the window. In a rush, aren't you, folks? Just wanted to tell you your taillight's out. Better get it fixed. You know, for a while I thought you were running away from me. Wow. I guess it's lucky for Webster that he was pulled over by the only cop on the highway who hasn't been listening to his radio all day. But the point is, not only does he not seem very upset that his hostage has just sabotaged him right in front of him, but she seems to take the whole thing almost like a joke. Start looking. For what? The ignition key. What did you think? The diamonds? See anything? I'm not looking. Got any matches? Listen, if you want to play rough. I don't want to play at all. Well then don't. <laughs> you could have shot me. I'm gonna try to make this thing start. Without a key? It wasn't my idea, you know. It's almost midnight. Oh, it is? Well, judging by the way the sun is shining on that car, I'm guessing this takes place somewhere in the Arctic. What's that? An extra key. Why didn't you tell me you had it? Why didn't you ask me? Yeah, because that's how a criminal would react to his hostage behaving that way. I feel like I'm watching a sitcom called My Hostage and Me. But meanwhile, it seems the trucker has survived the fight, no thanks to the diner owner, but is in critical condition in the hospital. But the two officers investigating the case want to get information out of him as soon as possible. You were in a fight, Nielsen. A man and a woman were there. Do you know who they were? Do you know what kind of car they were driving? Can you tell us? Were they driving an old car? Do you know the man who hit you? Couldn't it have been Frank Webster? Blink your eyes 48 times if it was Webster, and 42 times if it was Jimmy Hoffa. So Webster decides to spend the rest of the day for night shot hiding up on a hill away from the road. 
And I have to say, this scene comes closest to making you feel really tense and uncomfortable, just by the sheer implication of what he wants to do to her. But fortunately, it never gets that uncomfortable thanks to the sheer force of their bland acting. That and the fact that his nose keeps making me think of Richard Nixon. I am not a kidnapper. But in the morning, I guess he tries to make it up to her? All the comforts of home. Go wash your face. And you'll wake up feeling fresher, happier, and ready to beat the world. Thanks for that conveniently placed radio advertisement. I'd forgotten the benefits of washing. But uh-oh, a bulletin's been put out on the radio about Webster's latest crime. Along with a convenient recap of his previous crime, just in case the audience forgot. Police have broadcast a description of Frank Webster, still reported at large. In a wild race through the Coachella Valley, Webster forced another truck into the ditch. The truck overturned and killed the driver. Webster was arrested, but escaped from jail. Looks like they better get out of here quick before the film burns up. Well, looks like there's not much left for them to do on the way to Mexico, except exchange more hilarious dialogue. I'm hungry. I'm still hungry. So am I. But then as they get closer to the border, they're stopped by a police checkpoint. Where are you going? Mexico. Is this your uh, wife, Mr... Myers, Bill Myers. What's the trouble, officer? Looking for... Oops. I guess he can't ask any more questions now that the audio's cut out. Better just let him go through. My, it's a lovely day for a ride along the green screen. So Mr. Myers and his wife are going to Mexico. Where do they start from? How do they get there, hmm, Mr. Myers? Connie, you do realize that cop's part of the backdrop and can't hear anything you're saying, right? But wait, it looks like the case could finally break now that the trucker's starting to come around. You know what they were driving, can you remember? Jag. 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 Jaguar. Jaguar, it's a racing car. The waitress said it was a jalopy. Anyway, at this point, we gotta try anything. By tomorrow, most of those cars will be at the International, fenced into a five-acre park. Well, better pull over while the crew loads more stock footage. Maybe you'd rather register for the race. Or is that impossible, too? Register. Checkpoint number one. Checkpoint number one. What? Where did those come from? Did they just set up loudspeakers along a major highway? But Connie's plans to drive in the race hit an unfortunate snag when the announcer guy tells her... I, uh, guess you hadn't heard. They, uh, had a meeting last night. This course is too dangerous. All lady drivers are banned. But I've got to. I'm sorry, but that's what they decided. I'll drive. Oh, you're a racer too. Put me down. Wow, it sure is lucky for her that he doesn't have anything more important to do, like, oh, I don't know, get across the border to escape a murder charge? Well, Miss Adair can ride with me, can't she? Well, for the trials if she wants, but not tomorrow. You know, we've always had nothing but drivers in this race. Well, drivers and women, but then again, women aren't really drivers, now are they? Well, I'll be watching you, and I... <laughs> well, what's the matter, young lady? Are you hungry? Well, yes, I am. Well, if you'd like a sandwich... Oh, no, thanks. Never mind. She's always hungry. I like my women anorexic. So then they meet Connie's old friend, Brad. And for some reason, he never questions why there's a man with her who she's never spoken about or introduced before, and who seems to be ordering her around everywhere she goes. It's nice to have considerate friends. I said, Connie, why don't you just pull out as long as you can't drive? It might be easier than taking a chance with the car. I think I can manage it. Apparently. Say, Connie, how about taking in the mm -hmm. antique race with me this mm -hmm. afternoon? Or mm -hmm. are you busy with your driver? We'd be glad to. Thanks. What are you, her keeper? Sure thing. Thanks. Well, there's no reason to be concerned about her safety.
So the two of them put on their biohazard gear and go for a test drive around the course. Gear down! Put it in the lower gear at all sharp turns. Don't lose RPMs. And remember to keep your movements in sync with the film or this will look really corny. But trouble starts brewing when a police officer shows up to check the names of the registered racers. Uh, wait a minute, why is that sign backwards? Did they film this scene through a rear view mirror? Cross the court, post 12, that truck, post 12, that truck. All right, you guys with trucks, that was close. But now maybe you know what I've been talking about. Well, how can this guy see what they're doing? Does he have cameras and megaphones hidden everywhere on the course? Okay, 55. Myers, 55, you've qualified, second fastest time so far. So the two of them are pretty excited about qualifying for the race, but this police blockade in the park kind of puts a damper on things for Frank. What's going on down there? Oh, the cops, they're looking for a guy that they think's here in the park. You think this should be a crazy place to hide? Well, you never know what they're going to pull next. They figure he's going to be driving a Jaguar. What makes them think that? Some fellow broke out of jail with a murder rap. They don't expect him to be racing, but for that kind of a car, he'd hang around here until the heat's off. Well, thanks, Mr. Exposition. But we really need to get to our hiding spot out in the woods for unrelated reasons. And that's another thing. Why does she suddenly like him now? I mean, he hasn't really done a whole lot to prove that he's a good guy. She just seems to like him sometimes and then hate him at other times. It seems that the producers spent so much time on cars, chases, and cops that they forgot to add in actual character motivations. I discovered this place when I first started coming down to the races. I've sort of considered it mine ever since. Won't you come into my parlor? What's the pitch? Nothing. I'm just tired. So are you. Besides, you said something about an explanation. I'd like to hear it. On the level? Well, at the moment, the only thing I have against you is I never got that egg salad sandwich. <laughs> that and the fact that you kidnapped me, held me at gunpoint, and forced me to drive hundreds of miles across the state, but, eh, that's no big deal. You run away? Later. Oh, so now that he's got food, she loves him. Is she a woman or a pet goat? But it seems now that Webster is finally ready to tell his story. Listen, Connie, all my life I've been trying to get by on my own because that's the way I figured it. After the army, well, I saved some money, so I bought myself a truck. Not two trucks or a fleet. No partners, just me. Turned out I was bothering somebody. Guy who owned a lot of trucks. He tried everything. Undercut me, everything. But I figured I had my rights, so I stuck. And one of his drivers tried to run me off the road. All I was trying to do was keep from getting killed. And his truck went over the side. Two minutes later, one of his other drivers was there yelling his head off about how I drove his buddy over the cliff. He didn't even seem to care much that he was dead. No jury in the world would convict you if you told them what happened. Yes, I'm sure they'll listen to you now that you've kidnapped me, driven across the state, and tried to leave the country on a false name. But their discussion is cut short when Pa Kettle shows up to give them some exposition. Luckily, I came by. You know, after sunset, the cops patrol the park, and they arrest you and pinch you. Cops would come here? Yeah, looking for the kids, you know. Kind of uh, a lover's lane. <laughs> Why was I carrying the shovel again? Trust somebody. You see why I don't? Well, what do you expect? You hate the world, and the world hates you. And that specifically and especially includes me. Oh, I hate you now, especially since we ran out of graham crackers. Faber! Hey! Faber! Sit down. Well, where have you two been hiding out? Say, this isn't a big romance, is it? Oh, of course not. What time does the antique race start? We ought to make it just about now. Connie, I'll let you ride with me. Uh, no, thanks. We'll meet you there. Okay. Don't run away again. Gee, it's a good thing you weren't trying to ask me for help, Connie, or else my lack of curiosity could have put you in a lot of danger. And in this opening race, we have everything but the Stanley Steamer. 
Oh, I take it all back. Wait a minute. Here is the Stanley steamer, ready to defend its honor against the Model T. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Here comes Stanley's Maxwell. Ha, ha, ha. No one else understands why you're laughing at that. We really could use an explanation of who this guy is. Mr. Myers, how did you and Connie ever meet each other? Oh, look. And now we have the announcement of the winner in this, the last race. Mr. A.J. Jones driving his Maxwell. Wow, that sure was an exciting race. I'm sure glad we didn't get to see any of it. They're keeping it undercover, but a friend of mine told me they're looking for a murderer. Well, it sure is a well-kept secret, given the fact that you're the tenth person to talk about it this afternoon. Mrs. John Howell, your small son Peter, is at the announcer's booth. He says he isn't lost, but you are. I'm starting to think this guy will just say anything anyone tells him to into the microphone. Okay, what is going on with this lighting? There's so much shadow over their faces, I feel like I'm watching the famous people players. So Frank takes her to an abandoned shack out in the woods, where the two realize that they love each other for some reason. Why should I try to convince you that... I love you. I'm... Wow. Old rags, no furniture, and a collapsing roof? You sure know how to find the spot for a hot date, Webster. You're beautiful in the morning. Especially after you spent the night sleeping on a rickety floorboard. But then Frank decides that it's too dangerous for Connie to come with him to Mexico, so he traps her in the cabin and goes to the race. Oh, better not bang too hard on that door or the whole set could fall down. So after she realizes that there's no one around to hear her, she decides to set the place on fire. Because if you're trapped somewhere and no one is around to help, setting the place on fire can't possibly make things any worse. But oh, someone did notice. I'm not sure if Connie is really smart or really stupid to have tried that. But no time to explain anything or ask any questions, she's got a wanted criminal to catch up with. Oh boy, this is it. After an hour of build-up, it looks like we're finally going to get to some solid racing action. Awesome! I've seen stock car races, but never stock film races. You know, Webster is driving pretty well, considering that Connie had to talk him through the entire qualifying run. Police, listen very carefully. The driver of car 55 in the International is Frank Webster. Just tried to stop him at the border. He's innocent. Hmm, sure is convenient that they didn't ask her for any other information. But meanwhile, Webster is about to cross the border to Mexico. But I'm sure this kindling that the police have set up across the road will stop him. Oh no! Better not go chase him or anything. What is it? That's Frank Webster. I'll get him. Thankfully, I only need as much explanation as you can give in this hastily dubbed voiceover. But history repeats itself as the driver ends up swerving off the road into a tree. Wow. I don't understand why they disqualified women racers. Clearly she was able to drive a car at supersonic speeds safely to catch up with them. All right, Faber? Yes, thanks. You're a pretty dangerous character yourself. You could have run away instead of helping him. Why didn't you? Because you're right, Connie, and I'm going back. Besides, I'm in use to you. Oh, Frank, what you really are is worth fighting for. And it isn't too late. 
for us, it's just the beginning. Oh, no, you can't possibly... No, no. You're really gonna end it there, at the side of the road with a flaming car in the background and a guy who could die laying at your feet? We're just supposed to assume that everything works out happily with no explanation as to why he changes his mind or how he proves himself innocent? Well, whatever, it's over now. So I guess that's the Fast and the Furious. Was it bad? Well, it's definitely no Manos the Hands of Fate, but it's still poorly done in a lot of ways. The first problem is in the way the story is executed. The movie's title, poster, and opening sequence set it up as a high-octane car racing movie, but from there it seems to lose its focus on what it's supposed to be. First it's about a kidnapping, and then it becomes a Stockholm Syndrome romance. There's also some chase scenes and hiding from the police, and oh yeah, there's a race in this movie. There's so much else going on in this story that, honestly, the racing part seems almost like it was added as an afterthought. I'm not saying that everything in this movie should have been about the cars with no character development. I'm saying that the movie seems to lack focus on what it wants to be. And besides, even the character development doesn't work. It's extremely hard to identify with either Connie or Frank simply because we know almost nothing about them. Pretty much the only thing we know about Connie is that she races cars and has some friends in Southern California, I guess. We never know what her motivation is, where she comes from, or where she aims to go. Worse, the film almost seems to hint at a backstory, but then doesn't give it. Like in this scene, where she tries to enter the race. I guess you hadn't heard. They uh, had a meeting last night. This course is too dangerous. All lady drivers are banned. But I've got to. Why? Why do you have to? Are you trying to prove to someone that you can? Is this the race that a family member wanted to drive in but could never get to, so you're doing it in their honor? If you tell us why you care about this, the audience is that much more likely to care about it too. Frank Webster is a bit better, since we do hear something about his story, but still, it just seems tacked on. The movie basically tells us what he's like on the inside, but never shows us. He doesn't really do anything noble until the very end, and by then it seems like too big a change to be real. Oh look, he's kidnapped a woman. He must have a beautiful, anguished heart on the inside. For that matter, even the story of his jailbreak is confusing. For most of the movie, I was unsure whether he had already been convicted and sentenced or was awaiting trial. And then the movie just ends on an unclear promise that things will get better, but we never see a definite resolution. So basically, the movie starts with us knowing nothing and ends with us knowing not much else. Oh, but I guess it's a happy ending because Connie got her man. Isn't that what she was looking for? I guess it's hard to tell since the romance in the movie is all over the place too. Connie tries to resist Frank during the movie, but half the time it seems like she's just playing hard to get with him. She'll say she hates him and wants to escape, but the second he does even the smallest thing for her, she's all smiles again. It's like it doesn't matter if she's ever free or sees anyone she loves again, as long as he's giving her food and isn't trying to assault her. Oh, but wait, what's this on the movie poster? A wanted man meets a wanting woman. So this whole time, Connie has been looking for Frank? Oh, of course! Wasn't I silly? A woman wouldn't really be interested in racing or building a career, no! What she really wants deep down is a man! Ha ha ha! Oh, 1950s, you are a delight! That's the big problem with this movie. Practically everything is glossed over so that the plot can arrive at a half-baked, unimaginative conclusion without showing us any real resolution or character development. So many vague, underdone plot points can't draw viewers into the story, and if the only thing left after that is a bunch of cobbled together racing scenes made of stock footage, your movie is going to skid off the track. So that's what I thought of 1955's The Fast and the Furious. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to announce another race. Thanks for tuning in again to the Roy Unit Experience. And for those of you just joining us on the second annual Mimeograph 500, we see that Fibber McGee has just pulled out in front of Lord Snipe Tramwell as Pat Boone falls far behind into third. Regis Philbin begins discussing politics as he takes the turn, while Prince Charles maintains fifth position by throwing a beach ball at his opponent behind.
And Howard Hughes is forced to pull over so that he can check the stock of Standard Oil. And I'm sure that all spectators in the stands are wondering, could this possibly get more absurd? And there's a biplane on the track. 